without any further ado, let us begin. Hello, and welcome all future and current, of course, uh, Demon Mama viewers and my lovely, lovely imps, of course. This is a special stream. It's a bit of an experiment, okay? Um, I know we all are used to streams. We're used to seeing um, streaming topics and, and all kinds of things like this. But today I am telling a very personal story. I will be not responding to chat as much as I usually do. I will not be responding to donations and stuff like that as much as I usually do, um, if at all. Um, and I will be focusing on telling a sort of free flowing, but structured, but organic retelling of my experience growing up in a cult by the name of Calvary Chapel. I'm going to tell the history of Calvary Chapel, and I'm going to tell you what my experience was being in one of the more extreme branches of this church. I'm going to talk about my own emotional grappling with religion, some of the things I dealt with, how I ended up leaving the cult, how I ended up leaving Christianity, and my current thoughts on religion. This was inspired heavily by Good Mythical Morning, um, Rhett and Link, who are the, the creators of Good Mythical Morning, they did an Ear Biscuits podcast, which is their podcast that they do about personal issues. Rhett and Link talked about their spiritual deconstruction, and that motivated me to talk about my own. Um, I highly recommend it. Check out the Ear Biscuits podcast if you want to hear what inspired me to do this. It's a very different experience than my own, but it was very, very um, inspiring to me, and it got me to this point of wanting to do this and put this together. I have put a lot of research and um, – not research. I've put a lot of time into rewriting this, and I wanted to avoid it becoming like a giant no novel memoir, but it is going to take a while for me to tell the story. So please come get comfortable, sit down, and, and, and enjoy – the story I'm going to tell, and of course afterwards, as always, we'll do the stream stuff. We'll have questions. We'll have all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so if you have a question, by the way, you can plop it in chat, but also consider writing it on a note so that you can ask it at the end because I'll try to answer all the questions at the very end. And uh, if you're here, don't forget to hit a like down below, leave a comment, and subscribe, okay? I'm probably going to do this one other time besides this one, but other than that, Let's get right into it. And again, forgive me for any scuff. This is the first version of this story I've ever to told in one go. Um, I've told pieces of it at many different times. I've never done it all in one go. Forgive the scuff. I'm probably going to do a more advanced version in the future, but I want to, you know, you got to get it out there. So let's start. Let me start real quick by bringing up a piece of information that I forgot but see, the streamer experience already begins. But hey, it wouldn't be streaming if it wasn't, okay? If it wasn't a little scuffed. All right. So I, I want to talk about the church first that I grew up in, okay? This is going to be not the beginning of my story, but the beginning of the story of the church that I ended up becoming a part of. Um, Calvary Chapel is a um a huge church at this point um it was started in 1965 by a guy by the name of uh chuck smith um he founded it in california and uh it's been plugging along for a long time now he had a lot of success growing the church in the 80s uh among the sat satanic panic um in the 90s and into the 2000s and my family joined this church right about the cusp of the um turn of the millennium you know so 2000 was a big deal uh you know that was about when we joined approximately somewhere in that ballpark um and uh calvary chapel is a very unique evangelical christian church um they were very much inspired by the um, prosperity doctrines. Um, if And if you're not familiar with that, I know a lot of people here aren't super familiar with Christianity. The prosperity doctrine is a movement among specifically American Christianity that teaches that um, if you are blessed by God, you will be blessed with material riches. It is a very capitalistic version 
of um of Christianity that sort of embraces um em embraces this idea that that if you are holy, you will also be blessed financially because God will be taking care of you. They basically ignore the passage, the famous passage of the Bible that states, you know, it is harder for a rich man to walk through the gates of heaven than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Famous, famous passage. Um, but basically ignored. Now, if you went to a Calvary Chapel today, you would not think immediately that they were a part of this prosperity doctrine. Um, when you think of, when, when most people think of, um, of, uh, uh, when most people think of, um, of, of a prosperity doctrine, they think of people like Joel Olstein, um, the televangelists, uh, Ken, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Kenneth Copeland, people like that. The people who, uh, have gold watches and diamond rings and go on the TV and make big speeches. And that really wasn't Calvary Chapel's style, especially not the church that I went to. Calvary Chapel, um, is very capitalistic. Don't get me wrong, but they play it down. They uh, they don't encourage buying fancy cars or flying in private jets. They try to sell themselves as everyday folk, as populists. They're very much into that idea. Um, and they try to sell themselves sort of as a working class sect of Christianity that isn't... Um, that isn't obsessed with uh, with um, ritual like the Catholics or anything like that. Um, and uh, it, it's very interesting. They brand themselves, Calvary Chapel brands themselves as non-denominational. Um, it's part of their whole idea of like, we are going the true path. All of these other uh, sects of Christianity have, have been distracted from the truth and we are seeking the truth by being nonpartisan. It's like an enlightened centrist thing, but but that's very an, that's a very internet understanding of of like enlightened centrism. They really believe that declaring yourself as a sect of Christianity is like diminishes you. It's very weird. Um, so they're very serious about, but they're very serious about insisting that they're non-denominational. But they are indeed a denomination of their own form. Um, especially nowadays, you might be surprised. Um, like you might be surprised if you search Calvary Chapel, there's probably Calvary chapels near you. If you live in America, they are all over the place. They also have a pretty significant overseas presence in certain countries. Um, they are, uh, they are present in, um, uh, in Sudan. They are present in China. They are present in, um, Eastern Europe. So they have a huge missionary presence and they have, yep. And, and yep, they're present, they're present in Russia. Um, uh, one of our viewers here, Gayfesh, I've had a discussion with in the past. Uh, I will link the video down below. If you want to watch that one of us talking about our shared experiences in different church buildings, but of the same organization. Yeah. There's a, people, people often come in and are surprised to discover that a Calvary chapel is often near them. Now, I will start this out by saying not every single Calvary Chapel church is um, is as uh, extreme as the one that I grew up in. I was in a famously extreme one, but the foundations of the church are that extreme. So usually, as a church grows, it will trend further and further towards extremism because that's what the churches are designed to do. The plan as uh, as designed by Chuck Smith and those who um who followed uh like they they designed it that way they designed it to be fundamentalist and as a result even though some of the early churches are calm and chill and some of them maintain that most of them ultimately trend towards extremism fundamentalist extremism so that's the story of Calvary Chapel, you know, that the founding of, of, of Calvary Chapel. Um, no, they don't all grow to extremism. No, no, no. But many of them do. They have expanded all over the country, and there have been numerous very successful Calvary Chapels outside of Chuck Smith's original one. There was a very successful 
uh, mega church in uh, New Mexico, or sorry, in Arizona. Um, there in Phoenix, I believe it was. Or was it there? I, I, I'm getting I'm getting it mixed up. I think it might actually be in New Mexico. I apologize. Um, which one? Um, that's fine. Um, and there is also uh, a very very famous one in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which was originally run by a guy named Bob Coy, who is no longer a part of the church after his many unethicalities were exposed and but that is still a mega church that goes on strong even without their even without that leader they found another leader to replace him um and one of the most uh successful mega churches was where i grew up in new england i'm not going to be super specific because i don't really feel like the need but i just happen to be I happen to find myself and my family happen to find ourselves in the seedling version of what would someday become an incredibly influential megachurch. Now, by pure attendance, it doesn't seem like a megachurch, but there is no church nearby that even pulls close to as many, um, what's the right word, uh, attendees, believers, than the church that I grew up in. They were a megachurch church by by any standard it was it was unbelievable how far people would travel to come um to the to the church that i went to okay um so um now i'm going to tell you this now is when we get into the the sort of personal part of this i wanted to make sure that we understand what calvary chapel is on a historical level um where they came from and what they believe in. Um, and, oh, actually, you know what? Before we get into that, I should establish what Calvary Chapel tends to believe in. I, I realize I kind of glazed over that. Calvary Chapel, again, they are a church of the sort of prosperity doctrine, even though they don't openly admit it, which means they believe in expanding, 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 expanding. They believe in buying things. They will, the church coffers are huge. They will buy vehicles. They will buy radio stations. They will buy school buildings they use and leverage money to influence power they are not afraid to influence politics at all in fact they believe that their um that their uh, adherents should be deeply involved in politics they advocate for them to get involved in politics they protest things they're very uh, they're very very aggressive um and they're very opinionated um, the church has a very patriarchal bent. They are highly conservative. They are anti-gay. They are obviously anti-trans. They are um, they are uh, anti-evolution to an unbelievable degree. And there are strong um, veins of anti-psychology and anti-intellectualism all throughout the cult. Like, um, they're very, very much so. A, a quick little story that I think is relevant here. There was a porn shop that opened up once in my hometown, and it existed for about a month, uh, at which point it closed its doors because for the entirety of that month, uh, the local Calvary Chapel had or orchestrated a almost constant protest of the porn shop. So small town porn shop literally driven out of town. Yeah, pretty wild. That's the type of that's the type of approach they have. Now, some people would be tempted to think of of like the Westboro Baptist Church. Nah, they're way smarter than the Westboro Baptist Church. The Westboro Baptist Church is loud and super obnoxious and super aggressive, and they say you know all the the slurs and everything. Calvary Chapel doesn't do that. They're aggressive, but they keep their mask on to a certain degree. Okay, and um, and it's uh, it's really important to understand that because um they say yeah to a certain degree but calvary chapel is smart enough to know where the lines are very smart now another major part of of calvary chapel is that calvary chapel um is uh is is very 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 driven by charismatic men okay now that might not come as a surprise to you because that's all cults but Calvary Chapel is incredibly good at finding and recruiting charismatic men, okay? Like, they are very patriarchal, and they are—I don't know what they've done. 
and I would argue you could probably say it's some form of grooming, but nonetheless, they are able to locate charismatic men within their followings and promote them very quickly up to positions of great wealth and leadership in, in exchange for them to be able to be very convincing. And they are, and they do. And what will happen is they'll bring someone into the fold, they'll offer them work, they'll say, hey, why don't you go found this church? We'll give you some money, a whole bunch of money. You get to take your little trust and you will live a comfortable life and devote your life to building this church and recru recruiting um, lots of people. Good question, Lotus. Why do you think cult leaders happen to be men? I don't think it's an accident. It's not an accident. I think it's structured that way. They believe. They, it is part of the belief of the church that men are supposed to lead. And so they play into that. They play into these traditional structures intentionally. And they reinforce them. They make those rules. They want that to be the case. Um, yeah. So... That's part of the reason why. And also, they want, again, it's a lot of it is perpetuating it. A lot of that is perpetuating it. Tell that to Esther. Esther, I agree, but yeah. If there are a sect of Christianity, it's pretty obvious since women aren't allowed to be priests. That's not true about all sects of Christianity, but it is true about Calvary Chapel. Women are not allowed. Women are allowed to be in leadership, but they are allowed to be in women's leadership, which is definitively, clearly, and explicitly below the men. That is very clear. There is women's leadership. They need that. It's really important, but it's very explicit. Okay? They're very explicit about that. Okay. So there's their general beliefs. And as we go on throughout this, I'm going to talk about some things. We're going to even watch a sermon that I think is very important for to understand the flavor of the church. And we'll do that in a little bit. Okay? So now begins, officially, my part of the story, okay? When I was young, now, um, when I was young, uh, I really didn't have a, a full grasp of what religion was. Um, I was a, a really creative kid. Um, I had some weird issues um, with my body. Obviously, I'm trans, so... Um, not going to talk about that a whole lot today, but I had some weird things with that, but all in all, um, it was, uh, you know, my childhood was not, my young childhood was not bad. I was mostly allowed to be who I wanted to be. Most of my friends were, were girls. Um, and I was allowed to express myself however I wanted. We attended at that time, um, when I, the earliest church that I can remember, not Calvary Chapel. So, in fact, my first contact with Christianity was with a Wesleyan church. Now, that's a whole story in and of itself. Um, uh, Wesleyan beliefs are very different than that of Calvary Chapel. They have their own whole belief. It's a, um, it is a evangelical, but not strictly, not strongly evangelical, um, you know, uh, sect of Christianity. But it was great. Okay, that church, I have very fond memories of that church. Um, in fact, to the degree that like, I mean, I have a lot of, of very vivid memories of going to the church. Now, I don't remember anything about, um, I don't remember anything about what we learned there barely at all. I remember um, we, we saw Salty, who's like a, a, like a Bible mascot. Um, we went, to, we, there were some Bible events that we did. We watched... Um, uh, a bunch of bi biblical cartoons. We watched Veggie Tales. Um, we watch. We we had cookouts. I would go very frequently. Uh, salty. P S A L T Y. Um, salty. Uh, he's like a big Bible figure. He's like a a, a kids thing. Now, um, yeah, we, we used to watch. Well, I saw Salty live. It was wild. Um, kind of creepy. Yeah, but you know, whatever. Um, and I actually have really good memories because, uh, when I was super young, uh, like my family was close with the pastor and sometimes I would go hang out at the pastor's house. Like it was awesome. I remember they had a cute little house near my school. Um, sometimes I would go over there when I was at my cousin's house, I would hang out, um, and walk over and just be like, Hey, pastor Steve. That was his name. His name was pastor Steve. 
Yeah, yeah, VeggieTales was fun. VeggieTales, by the way, I still think highly of VeggieTales, but we're not going to talk about that. I was like, hey, Pastor Steve, and he, his daughter was my friend. Um, she was older than me, and so I saw her kind of like a big sister, you know? Um, and Pastor Steve, for the record, was a good man. For all that I know, I, I've never heard a single bad thing about Pastor Steve. I don't think that Pastor Steve is a bad man at all. In fact, I think he's a, a really good guy. Um, Pastor Steve was great. And, uh, and in fact, when I would go over there, I would play, I, I had, uh, I would go over there and play NES games. So they had games I didn't have. They had Legend of Zelda. They had, um, I'm trying to think some of the other games they had. They had, uh, oh God, I'm, I'm forgetting some of the names. Uh, Star Tropics. They had Bible Buffet. They had all of the Christian games. And some of them, I liked some of the Christian games when I was a kid. Um, they had, I had Mario, but I didn't have Zelda. I didn't have, no, nah, Contra was too violent. They didn't like that. Yeah, Bible Buffet. I liked that one. Um, they had Star Tropics. They had the Jaws game. I can't believe they had the Jaws game. I loved it. Um, I am old enough to be nostalgic for the NES. The NES was my first system. So, yes, actually I am. Um, and yeah, I'm an old lady. Yeah. Um, I'm 30, just for all of you who, who don't know that. So, but I had, I was poor, so we had an old one. Anyway, we, they had a bunch of cool games, and they also had a really cool basement that had all kinds of cool, um, stuff, like sports stuff in it, you know, like ping pong and foosball. It was really, really great. Um, and so I had a really good experience with that. And even the early Christians, the super Christian stuff, the Christian Bible schools, the baking, all of that stuff was awesome. And you might be thinking, well, damn, like this cult doesn't sound so bad. Well, you'll remember that wasn't the cult. That was the church we went to before the cult. And they were good. And it's sad we didn't stay there because I have, I, I, I have memories from when I was like five or six that were so good from that church. And it's a shame we didn't stay there. Sometime around the end of the 90s, um, we moved. And when we moved, my dad and my mom were going through a lot of things behind the surface that I didn't even know. And they had come, my dad especially, specifically, had come to the conclusion that um, the church that we were in was spiritually dead. Now... That didn't make any sense to me. And I remember him saying that, and it didn't make any sense to me at the time. I didn't understand what something meant to be spiritually dead. I was like, what? Like, what does that mean? And then my dad explained it like, oh, they were complacent. Um, they were, you know, too liberal or whatever. He didn't really say it like that yet. Though at this time, my dad was getting into um, Rush Limbaugh at the same time. My dad started getting into Rush Limbaugh. And he had decided, all right, we need to find a better church. And uh, so the, ch the search for a church began. Um, and uh, it didn't take long for us to find Calvary Chapel. And when I started, so this was, this is something that was distinct. I want. I made a specific note of this, by the way. Um, when I was a kid, I had no idea, like I had no concept of feeling spiritually different. Obviously, I thought I was kind of a weird kid, but it was never anything that was like super, super bad. Um, but I never remember feeling like spiritually different. And that really changed. That changed fast, okay? So what I say, what I mean by that is that when I used to go to church, it was a social experience, and it always seemed to be a social experience. Everyone was welcome. There was a lot of love. There was a lot of positivity, um, and there was a lot of focus on, like, baking and charity and stuff like that. And um, and so I never really felt like that, that there was, like, we were supposed to be different from other Americans or anything like that. At, at, at the Wesleyan Church— we were encouraged to do normal American things and, and, and play video games and have fun. And, you know, they were like, don't play violent video games. You know, that's, that's too much. Don't be, don't be violent, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and I remember never really feeling like we were supposed to be something different. We were just Christians. Everybody was a Christian in my mind. That's what I thought. When we went to, when we started attending Calvary Chapel, that changed. Okay. That's when that started to change. So, um, I don't remember a whole lot of the very beginning of my time at Calvary Chapel. Um, when I first started going there, it was hosted in this, uh, totally the, the now hold on. I should be clear. When I first started going to Calvary Chapel, the children's service was hosted in this like weird house. Like it was just like a house that had been, it was like an old house that had been converted into like office space and then converted into like, uh, like having a little tiny auditorium. So it was like an old, you know, if you've ever lived in a, in like a state, in a place where there's old houses, um, like they get converted a lot. And at first it was just this dingy old house and they had like a, the bottom floor had like a big ballroom in it. And then the upper floor had been at one point office space and was now like little, like almost like schoolhouse rooms. And I barely remember anything from there, I, except I do remember them getting very mad about Harry Potter. That I do remember. They were super mad about Harry Potter. They encouraged everyone to not do Harry Potter. No Harry Potter. Um, they really didn't like Harry Potter. Um, and uh, yeah, so I do remember that. Then I was getting to the point where I was getting a little older and the children's ministry stuff wasn't really doing it. Like I wasn't, I was having a hard time keeping entertained in the children's ministry and they encourage you once you get to a certain age to um to like move on to the official stuff so i started attending with my parents the main church uh attraction the main sermons which interestingly now this is a weird little twist of fate um um i would end up so this church was at the time hosted in the in an ancient building a a a very very old school building which used to be a catholic church and now was a private or not a catholic church a catholic school and now was a private school and they rented out their auditorium um and it was this cr it was this crazy ornate auditorium it was super cool it had like old school balconies with seats on it that people could sit in. Then it had an open floor area on the floor with lots of seats. The ceilings were all this like old style, um, fancy ceiling, not like a cathedral ceiling, but like carvings and whatever. And they had this carving of William Shakespeare over the stage. And the reason why I remember all that is because I was so bored in those sermons that I would sit back in my chair and just look and analyze the patterns on the ceiling and look at, at um at shakespeare's face and whatever um and i was very distracted very distracted and and whatever um and i remember just spending a lot of time looking at these things um because i was kind of bored and i didn't really get the religion thing yet um and it was there that i started to get a lot more religious yeah um the a lot more religious and and um this was for a couple of reasons first of all my parents had a really messy divorce during this time a really messy divorce and it hurt our family admittedly um um yeah uh, mother mir said we can uh, we can talk about it but anyway uh my family had a big uh, very messy um situation my dad left just he was gone and uh, it was very complicated, and my dad wasn't gone completely, but it was complicated. I didn't see my dad for a couple months. Now, keep in mind, my dad had been living with me for um, for years, for my whole life. Now, hold on a second. Now, now actually back to the story. Okay. So, um, my family had a uh, a big divorce. It was a big mess. Um, and, uh, my mom was really hurt in the whole process and justifiably so. Like, I think that she was completely justified. My dad was a horrible asshole. Um, and she turned to the church. 
And that's how a lot of these things operate. A lot of cults prey on people who are hurting and who are in need and who might be abandoned. And keep in mind, my dad had all the money. My dad is a rich man. My mom was not. My mom was very poor. She didn't have anywhere to turn. She didn't have much family. Um, it was not good. Um, and so my mom found herself in a very rough position. And I was just a kid, so I didn't get all of this at the time. I couldn't figure this all out at the time. A lot of this is stuff that I figured out later. Um, but um, my mom was brought in by the church. And I later found out that, like, literally, um, the pastors basically moved in on her. And, in fact, I, I did find out later that there were pastors who basically tried to, like, flirt with her, like, really hardcore and did other things like that. So, but we, I didn't know that at the time. I had no idea. Nonetheless, she was love bombed hardcore by the church. And so was our family. And they came in and they were like, we're going to help you. We're going to save you all this stuff. Come get involved. Da, 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 da. Okay. And that's when, um, when, uh, that's when I started getting more into the church. Because we were going all the time. We were at church all the time. All of our friends were friends from the church. So I started getting involved in it. And when I got involved, I was very passionate. You all know me. Those of you who watch my show, you know I'm very passionate about stuff. I research. I love research. I love reading. I'm like, I dig into stuff. And that the Bible became like a fixation for me. Um, I dug really deep into the Bible. I was really passionate about it. I started paying attention in all the lectures, in all the sermons. I was like, oh, wow, there's a lot here. There's a lot of truth, you know? And I remember all kinds of stuff from this time. Um, you know, uh, I remember, I remember this one night. Let me tell a quick little, there's going to be little side stories like this that give you an idea of where my mind was at. I remember a night distinctly a co i think it was i want to say it was like end of summer approaching autumn starting to get a little chilly my window is open i was in my bed and i had a whole bunch of blankets on and i was just sitting there thinking and i had been reading the bible before bed and i was trying desperately to think about the idea of eternity you know and i was trying to conceptualize it in my mind and i really couldn't it was so hard for me to understand and i kept thinking like well wait a minute are we going to be singing on like what is this what does eternity look like and i start to, to think about it even more and i got really lost in it and you know if you've ever like been like sort of starting to doze off while you're thinking about something big it can be pretty weird it can be a pretty weird experience and i was young and i'm sitting here and in my mind i'm visualizing the longest period of time I could possibly imagine, and that isn't even the beginning. And that terrified the hell out of me. The idea that the longest period I could possibly even imagine in my imagination wouldn't even be the beginning of eternity just blew my mind. And so that was a moment of religious fervor basically, I realized, oh my God, eternity is serious business. And if this is what they're saying is true, I got to take this shit seriously. I got to take this shit seriously because that's forever. And again, that's what cults do. They convince you of things that conveniently align with their goals. So I started biting into it. And um, around this time, my church had grown quite a lot. The preacher um, was uh, a firebrand. He had gotten his start in uh, prison ministry. So he would go into prisons and, and, and preach to the prisoners and convert them. He was, a, he was a big, muscular guy with a big beard. In fact, we're going to show him in just a minute. And I'm going to show you what he talks about and the things that he does, Okay. Um, and it is intense, so we'll, we'll get there. Um, but he was having a lot of success. He was winning over a lot of people. Um, he was pulling a lot of people into this, um, into this church. 
and he had a lot of ambition. So they wanted to expand, and they did. They expanded from renting an auditorium um, a couple nights a week to buying a school. Just think about that jump. They went from renting two little buildings and they grew and they were pulling in so much money that they decided to buy an old school. A school, in fact, Lotus, you'll remember this. I know, you know, <laughs> the school that my cousin went to. So it had this weird mystique for me. You know, it had a personal level. I was like, whoa, wait a second. My cousins went there. I know this school. Um, it happened pretty quick over the course of like a couple years, I would say. Um, and, um, this school was no longer being used, um, because the school had built a, the, the, the town had built a new school building, um, and they just bought the old, um, they bought the old, uh, building and turned it into a church. It was a school building that had a church in it. And they decided to, um, to, they decided to um, also begin the process of opening a Christian school in the school that was also the church. And once they got in here, they grew really fast because there was a lot more room. They made a lot of attention for themselves. They, they got a big fancy sign and they put it out front. Um, they had a park. They had like a little playground there that people could go to. They had, they had a big parking lot now. They made a name for themselves, and they were pulling in people from all over the place. And uh, this building was, is, you know, it's an old school building. The, at first, the ser sermons were held in the basement of the school building, which had previously been like, a, like an auditorium center for the school. But then they decided to build their own auditorium, and they built a giant studio auditorium at the at the back of the at the back of the building the back of the school like a, a a huge one with giant bleachers um it had a command little like not a command yeah it had a control center for their their media stuff it had studio lights it was their own that was the project that i watched happen while i was there and if you're there if you're in something like this the feeling of of that being built up around you is unbelievable you are involved in the growth of 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 this thing and you all some of you know that because you've watched streams succeed and grow and whatever and that's a cool feeling that is a good feeling to have but in this case it is weaponized for a lot of bad things because I went from being in this tiny little church that was in in another in in like a, a rented auditorium to them being in a school building with a big auditorium to them building their own auditorium in the course of a few years. That was an experience that I experienced firsthand. I watched a mega church appear out of nowhere, and to me at the time, it was like a demonstration of God blessing this church. Look at. We must be doing what's right because we're growing, we're succeeding, all that sort of thing. Yeah. And um, and it was exciting. It was cool. Um, and uh, sometime around this point, uh, sometime around there, before we had the auditorium, um, I met um, Kent Hoven. Does anybody know Kent Hoven? Some of you might know. Kent Hoven is a – I'll show you him on screen real quick. He's uh he's kind of famous from the atheist era of of YouTube. Um here we go. Look at this guy. This is him. He looks like this. Kent Hoven. Um uh he was a a very famous this was before he went to prison. That's a mugshot. Yeah, he went to prison for um tax fraud, yeah. Um and uh and and he ran an anti-evolution uh ministry. Like strictly anti-evolution i met him personally i asked him for religious advice personally as in i talked to him and i said hey here's my question and he said hey let me tell you and um and yeah it was wild um and uh yeah so that happened that was a huge deal 
um, and brought a lot of new people. Again, new people coming in. It was it, it's a whole thing. Um, yeah, he talks for a long time, but but yeah. Um, no, he that was not during a sermon. This was afterwards. So one of the things he would do, and this is common, by the way, one of the things that a lot of like religious people will do is after their show, they will mingle around with people. They'll hang around and they sort of like use their celebrity status to connect with people and, and, and win over new followers and be like, hey, let me give you some, let me impart you some spiritual wisdom. You know, it's hobnobbing. It's all that kind of thing. Um, and, um, yeah, they make it makes it more personal. It is it is parasociality. They are they are they are riding on parasociality, a hundred percent. Yeah, totally one hundred percent. Um, just so you know. That that sort of thing happened ha has happened and been happening long before streaming ever happened. Um and uh yeah, so I met Kent Hoven during this time. Um and then I got really involved, okay? Because at this point my family was super involved. We were going to church all the time. I'm talking two, three times a week at church, sometimes more, depending on what was going on. I got involved in the um, the vacation Bible school stuff. So like one year, I was a, a, a religious seahorse, and I told Bible stories to children, and my head fell off once, and it was very funny. I ran out, and I was like, it's me, the seahorse, and my little outfit got caught on a pipe and it ripped the head off and everybody laughed at me, but the children thought it was funny. So it worked out. Um, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and I got really involved and, um, then I got baptized because I'd never been baptized. I didn't know what baptism was previous previously. I may have heard of it, but Calvary chapel made a big deal out of um out of um baptism a big deal out of baptism and um there was i'm trying to remember exactly how it worked out they t they would do this thing so they would do this thing calvary chapel would do this thing so one of the things that was very popular um that calvary chapel would do is they liked a lot of like social pressure and i really like the movie midsommar for this reason i know this might not this reference might not last forever, but there's a movie called Midsommar, and it plays on a lot of this as well, like how social pressure is used to get people to participate in things. So one of the things that Calvary Chapel would do is they would have sermons, a big, fiery, emotional sermon, and then they would be like, all right, everybody, let's, let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes, and if you're out there right now and you feel God calling you, putting, you know, God is coming, you know, like touching your spirit and calling you to step further with your faith. You go ahead and raise your hand. Nobody can see you. You just raise your hand if you feel God moving you. And then they would move out this big tub, a huge tub, and they would say, all right, now you don't have to do this. They would say, but it's there. The pressure's there. If you're feeling motivated and you think god's calling you stand up we are we are challenging you stand up today and see that the church will take care of you and so people would stand up and they would say and people would clap when they stood they would clap everybody would clap when you stood up and then they would say all right everybody let's pray and so they would ask everybody to put their hands and this is called laying on hands okay if you've ever heard of that, this is what this is, laying on hands. They would ask all of the people to come by and just place a hand on the person who stood. Everybody around would come put their hands on and people would begin to pray. And during this prayer, you would be asked to sort of repeat after um, after the, the um, you know, the, 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 the you would repeat after the, the pastor asking for forgiveness for your sins and then they would offer you after this they would offer you a challenge come on up and get baptized and devote your life to Jesus today and right then and there you would be on the spot and there's the pressure and people would go up they would step into the tub and they would get baptized and um, and uh, 
and it happened all the time. And then afterwards, they, they would counsel you and all this kind of stuff, and they made it a huge deal. And, um, and yeah. Then there was more, there was another, now this is, that is the typical baptism experience. However, I was baptized at a special event because, you know, you can keep quiet in church, but it's a lot harder to resist when it gets really, really intense. Okay. And I'll tell you that story because this was a huge deal. Somewhere in this house, I have a framed picture of me being baptized. I don't know where it is. It's off in storage. I didn't want to dig it out for this because it's ancient memory. But I have a picture. I had a picture taken and framed by my parents when I got baptized in the ocean of New England. I, we went to an event and Calvary Chapel always had a flair for theatrics. So we held a, there was the church held a, a massive, um, barbecue picnic preaching session at a ocean beach. And of course, because it's powerful, it's powerful imagery. They would give a seaside sermon and the pastor would walk out into the water they would walk out into the water and he would preach from the water. Okay. So he'd be like, God, blah, blah, blah. And then he would say, all right, everybody, if you feel God calling you to be baptized, walk out to me in the water. And he would, and you could raise your hand and he would call you out. And I did. I was moved by the sermon, by the sermon. And I walked out into the ice cold water and was baptized in fucking ice fucking cold water nope no swimsuit he was just in his clothes again they play up the like every man shit it was it was bioshock infinite shit it really reminded me of that in a lot of um cases no preaching robes there were no preaching robes he wore normal clothes and i'm going to show you so um so this was the story of my baptism. And that was when I truly became, in my mind, I was in to the church. I was like, wow, okay, this is moving. There's something happening here. And I didn't know because I was just a kid, but it was, that's how it's designed. It's designed to feel magical, to feel supreme, to feel, to feel divine. It's, the, it's like an anime. I was like living in an anime. I had, it's funny. When I was baptized, I had to give my mom my Yu-Gi-Oh cards because I had brought my Yu-Gi-Oh cards to play with my friends. So I was like, hey, mom, can you hold my Yu-Gi-Oh cards? I'm going to go get baptized. So it is. It's, it's incredibly emotionally powerful. It's incredibly manipulative. It's, it's ritual. Um, and um, yeah, um, how old was I? I was about 13 at that time. I was about 13. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about the baptism and how it was a very m m emotionally moving experience. Now, after my baptism, again, I became very involved in the church at this point. Um, I became very, very involved in the church at this point. Um, as in, my fervor for religion began to reinforce my mom's. And it was, I was so passionate about church that I was partially responsible for motivating our whole family to go to church. Um, it was, it was wild, but I mean, that's how it works, right? You get very passionate about it and you start to care. I'd thought about eternity. I was, uh, very passionate. I would encourage us to go to church. I would be like, Oh, we should go to church. We should go to church. We should go to church. And I was really involved in the, the, in, uh, I would go to summer camp and some of them were great. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but, Mostly, I just wanted to go learn more about the Bible. And, um, and oh my goodness, it was a lot, okay? Um, and it, I, was, I was reading the Bible constantly. At this point, I made, um, I got into this point in my life where um, I, I was becoming very, I, I didn't know this is what it was at the time, but I was becoming very paranoid about, 
and obsessive about religion. And I didn't know that. It was encouraged, in fact. I was encouraged to be this way. But I couldn't sleep at night unless I read my Bible and prayed first. And I would get very mad if I accidentally fell asleep and then um, woke up um, and then woke up in the morning and realized I hadn't prayed. Um, I would get frustrated at myself and I would punish myself. Um, well, see, the thing is, hexagram, real quick. When you look back, do you feel guilty for pushing church on your family, even if that feeling is irrational? No, because um, it was just like, I was just matching like the energy of my mom and the church. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, punish, uh, oh, like I would, I would make myself read twice as much Bible the next night. Um, and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it was it, looking back. I do think there's some elements of obsessive compulsive behavior, especially later on. Now we'll get into this as time goes on, but something that I ended up developing later on was, uh, I would, I would panic over small decisions. So things like, um, so things like choosing clothes or cereal in the morning or which order to do things in, I would, uh, freak out and I would be like, which one does God want me to do? And if I couldn't tell if I, if I, if it didn't intuit to me, it would be, it must've been because God was trying to tell me that the path was unclear. And that makes no sense to anybody else necessarily. But in my mind, I was like, wait a minute, I should know God should be able to guide me to which cereal I should eat, to which clothes I should wear. Otherwise, I could be missing something. What if this starts a butterfly effect and bad things happen? It sounds silly, but when you're a kid, you know, these things don't make sense. Um, and, uh, yeah, decision fatigue. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people probably have experienced this. It was wild. Um, that Now, that didn't happen until a little bit later, um, m for the most part. There were a couple of things, but that happened a little bit later when I had a little more um, agency in my own life and my mom wasn't making decisions. Um, so before we get any further into that, I want to show you the types of, ex of, of sermons that had caught on at my church, okay? So because this was a growing church, the pastor that I studied under— um, who I was very, my family was very close with. We'd been with the church for a long time. Um, so, uh, but he was getting, he was growing too. He was changing his style. He was changing his approach. He was uh, defining it and he was becoming a celebrity. Now, he had won such a name for himself by growing this church so quickly that he was traveling. Well, and this would happen more, but he was starting to travel around the world and teach other people. And inspire other churches. Yes, correct, aristocracy. The stress that every little thing you're going to do is going to make you impure or that it's the wrong decision. Correct, you're on it. We'll talk about that a little more in a little bit. So I want to watch this this sermon with you all, okay? Now, this is an intense sermon. And this is not This is a newer sermon. But this is the style of shit that we did, that he gave all the time. I'm, I'm serious. Like... We would have sermons of this level of intensity frequently. Now, this one is, I will, I will say, this is an is it's so good, it it's so quote unquote good, um, that he, you know, put this on YouTube. But we're gonna watch it. And and I think you're gonna get a feeling for the type of things that uh I experienced and why this religion was so successful, okay? And some of you have seen this before if you're old school fans of me, but it's all right, okay? This is called the feelings rant, and and th and by the way, this is a not this is from some time recently. But I have I went I sat through an equivalent version of this rant. He would tell this all the time. Okay, so let's watch together. We'll have to anyway. Also, well, you know what? Well, this is my this is the pastor that I grew up under. Now he's older now, but when he was at his prime, this guy was ripped. Just so you know, ripped as hell, and he's still pretty ripped. So listen to this and tell me if you don't if this doesn't. Yes, my pastor was Giga Chad. This was my pastor. I spent time with this man. I talked to this man. He counseled me. 
he guided me. This was the guy. Yeah. So just listen to the thing, okay? Let's get into it, and then we'll talk after. While we're working on our speech, while we're working on our speech, my dear brothers, you guys are all aware, and none of you are so foolish as to follow the example of the crass, the careless, the, the trendy guys who thought it would be really cool to throw in profanity and get, get you know, street level. I guess that's what they were trying to do. Now, we're not that stupid, right? Of course not. But there is one particular four-letter word. Starts with an F. And it needs to go. It's the word feel. No, decupine. Get no. it out of your, your get it out of your vocabulary. I am talking to men of God who keep going. Well, I just feel I feel like the Lord's doing a thing. I feel a I feel like it. They go, like, what are you doing right now? Well, we were doing this, and now we, we feel like the Lord's calling. We feel you feel you don't feel. The just shall live by faith alone. I I I just did a red eye last night coming back from Oregon, and we had a great time. The Lord was with us there. And, I went on this rant with the, the brothers there. Because I see everywhere, everywhere I turn, I'm, I'm counting them. I'm that way. I'm counting. Whoa, well, well, you just did three. I feel. Stop it. And, and then <laughs> I, I go on this rant, and I'm on my way out of there. I got to fly out of Portlandia and <laughs> stop on the way to the airport at a Panera Bread. And I'm standing there looking at the menu. I don't know what it, I can't. I'm looking at a sandwich, and it's a steak and arugula, but I can't remember what arugula is. <laughs> I know that's stupid, but anyway, so I turned to a young woman in line, and I said, excuse me, you, what's arugula? Her opening words, I feel like you either like it or you don't. I feel like... <laughs> and and there's a, it's crept into the church, brothers. There, there, this, this, is, this is the weirdest phenomenon, and I remember noticing it when it entered culture. And it was about a decade and a half ago, and all of a sudden, that age group that were college age could never say, I know, I think. They never could make a statement without I feel in front of it, because that has supreme authority. You can't argue with that. It's what they feel. It's their reality. I mean, it's like everything, it, constantly. I feel like, I, I feel... I feel like you're mocking me. No, I'm not. It's not a feeling. I am mocking you. I feel like even, even the things that aren't feelings, you're like, hey, anybody, any of you, you people, anybody see my keys? I feel like they're in the kitchen. It's not a feeling. Stop it. That's a thought. You have facts. You got something. Give me something more than your feelings. Looking for the keys. So correct it in yourself, then correct it in the rest of the world around you. But don't be, Jordan, don't, be, don't be talking about... Interesting sort of Jordan Peterson stuff there, just as a note. Think about it for just a second. The, 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 the apostles of our Lord. Did any of them write the word feel once in any of their epistles? Can you imagine the apostle Paul? Timothy, I feel like you need to stay in Ephesus... And then you get you get that uh, that that silly synthetic Christian pop hit from Toby Mac. I feel him in my heart. I feel him in my soul. That's how I know. Oh oh oh. <laughs> and you go. Did you, did you get that at Liberty University? You. You feel him, that's how you know. We need to confront that one head on, but to the text, brothers. Besides that, on top of all of that, we're men. We have feelings, but they're small. They're not worth talking about. Okay. So now you have an idea. This was the type of church 
experience that I had. And keep in mind, this is his rant about masculinity and feelings. He would talk about masculinity constantly. It was a cult of masculinity that was so uh, unbelievably pervasive. And by the way, um, this guy was... Uh, there's a lot of things I could talk about. Let's just say there was a lot of things that were behind the curtain that a lot of people didn't see. Uh, they hated women preachers. I happen to know because they talked about that all the time. They would rant about that very, very, um, you know, very uh, constantly. Um, it is a, a, it is a, a religion that, that crushes your individual feelings, negates them, makes them, um, I didn't know that I was trans, but I was struggling with trans stuff. We're just not, I'm not talking about the trans stuff much today because it's a whole other thing. Um, but, um, yeah, there was a, a, it was a, um, cult of this. And remember, you know, I am trans. So at this time I was, uh, by all appearances, people thought I was a boy. And this, I don't know, most men aren't this masculine. Very few men are this masculine. So for me, it was especially uncomfortable, but there's lots of men who can't live up to this level of masculinity, but the pressure was always there. And you'll notice that dripping in this, in this speech is prejudice against weak men, against gay men who are weak, against weak women, feeling-based women. It is, it is a cult of of strength and um it was very fashy and there are uh, people who said that in chat are not wrong to point that out um and keep in mind that like in addition to this he would do saturdays they would have a men's bible study on early saturday mornings where they would work out first then they would do a Bible study, and then they would do manual labor together of some sort. That was, they did that. That was what they did. And um, this was a huge part of the of the um, of the church. Um, this guy uh, talked to us about masturbation. This guy talked to us about sex. This guy talked to us about all kinds of things. Okay. Um. And he would tell us about all the things of being a, a man in his eyes and all of this nonsense, okay? And I do happen to know that, um, again, he had some skeletons in his closet. Though none of the, the like, actually gay and, and um, you know, he's not, as far as I know, I don't think he's gay. But, um, but he did uh, have some, he destroyed a number of marriages. Um, oh, yes. You know, you can guess them. Yep. On virginity and purity, absolutely. Now, um, uh, was he pro masturbation? Um, he was anti masturbation. Um, you know, um, and it was complicated, but yes, he was more or less anti masturbation. Oh, absolutely, premarital sin is a type. Let me give you a quick anecdote following from this. So, um, uh, there was a, a, child of one of the pastors of our church who got caught making out with his girlfriend in the car in the in the corner of the parking lot of the Calvary Chapel and the freak out was so bad that it ended up leading that pastor and their family to leave the church so that pastor is no longer associated with the church because his son kissed his girlfriend in the car that's the level of purity that this church had with that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was very bad. Um, yeah. So, again, y you've got the idea now of, of what I'm talking about. Of what I... And again, three at this point, you know, as time went on, we started attending church three times a week. We would usually go Sunday morning... We would go Wednesday night, and then we would usually go to a youth group or something along those lines. 
Um, so, um, very intense guy was incredibly, incredibly effective preacher, highly emotional, highly, uh, zealous. You can sense the power and you can understand also what, well, see, that's the thing. It wasn't boring. I mean, this guy was screaming about things. God wants you to fight, pick up your sword and fight for God. Never boring. Now, later on, he got busy and other pastors um, came in and and weren't as exciting. And yeah, it was, yeah, it's not boring. It was very intense. Um, yeah. So um, again, we were going to church all the time and it was affecting my, my studies. And eventually um, I decided in about, we moved, okay, so this is complicated. Uh, in seventh grade, I decided, um, that, um, I, I decided that, um, I wanted to go to the Calvary Chapel school at about seventh grade. And, um, I went and it was the one time in my life where my grades truly suffered. I was a very good student. Um, I, as you can tell, I love learning. Even though I had ADHD, I did very good in school. Oh, he, yeah, pick up artist vibes. There's a good reason for that. He had, he was fucking a lot. That's for sure. Um, but anyway, I uh, decided to attend the Christian school and it sucked. It was bad. I didn't like it, actually. Even though I was super involved in the church, I had a bad time. First of all, we learned from a Christian science book, which was terrible. The science teacher was really bad, totally unqualified. My English teacher was also really bad, really unqualified. My math teacher, bad, unqualified. Um, and um, mostly we just spent a lot of time studying the Bible when we should have been studying other things. My grades tanked. I was bullied. Um, I started having some behavioral issues, and I decided to stop attending that school, thank God, a year later. But, the re but some of my family did not. Many of my family members continued going to that school. Now, I got in trouble a lot. Weird. I wonder why, right? A uh, a soft, intellectual boy who doesn't, who's, who's chubby boy at the time, remember? I'm trans. Trans. But I was chubby at the time. I was soft. I was not uh, masculine like they were supposed to be. And I got in trouble a lot. I got in trouble a lot. Thankfully, I was able to leave the school because my grades were bad and my parents knew that it wasn't working out. Thankfully, I left. But I didn't stop being very religious. And I was going to summer camps. Um, I, I, uh, I was going to summer camps. Now, I have some interesting stories about summer camps. And I want to tell some of them because they're a nice little break from the dark stuff. And they're also very interesting. So um, I want to talk about some of these summer camps. Um, most of them were actually very positive experiences, believe it or not. The summer camps were, uh, we would go on a big bus out into the middle of nowhere. Um, there was a, this amazing, this amazing lodge. Okay. So, uh, a friend of the church owned a mountain lodge and a, a whole lot of land. And they had built this lodge that had a, it was amazing. Let me just describe this for you, okay? So you drive up a dirt road up the side of a mountain with nothing else on it for like like all the way around this mountain and you go way up and then there was a, a big flat area and this big wooden lodge with a huge, yeah, like a chalet, yes. And it had a big cathedral ceiling with a huge fireplace and a cross over it. And that was where you would get the preaching. And they had these big windows that overlooked a field on the side of a mountain. And then from there, the field dropped off and it was woods as far as the eye could see. You could see half the state from this place. So from the, the church area, you would look out and you would just see it was wonderful. It was beautiful. It was breathtakingly beautiful. And they had these bunk rooms that were attached. It was very warm. It was modernized. They had electricity. It was amazing. And um, they had a 
the basement area had like a cafeteria in it and a rec room. They had an arcade cabinet that had a whole bunch of old Atari games in it. They had a basketball court in the basement. Um, and there was a path that would let you hike the mountain right next to it. F so cool. And in the winter, and in the winter, if you went to the winter camp, they would, uh, you would go up the mountain and they had a area that was curated for sledding. So they would have a big heavy duty truck at the bottom and you would take an inner tube and you'd shoot down the mountain and have a great time. And then everybody would get in the big truck and the truck would drive up the mountain path and then you would do it again. It was so cool. Now that part was fucking awesome. And that shit was really fun. And, and, uh, and despite the fact that every day you would do Bible studies and lots of praying and all that shit, most of it was pretty fucking cool. I got to climb mountains. I got to talk with friends and we laughed about stuff. Now, there was some weird things that happened, which I will talk about. One was that um, they had communal showers, which was, uh, I was, most, most guys, I'm not, I wasn't a guy, but most guys um, were very comfortable with that. I was terrified of that. I was the type of kid who I would only ever change in a, in a, in a stall. And, and that should tell you everything you need to know about me being trans. I didn't even know what being trans was, and I was terrified of anyone seeing my body. So I would, so basically, I would avoid the showers. Um... Yeah, exactly, exactly. That part is cool. Um, I would avoid the showers. And maybe that was for the best, to be completely honest. Maybe that was for the best. I don't know what happened. Um, but I wouldn't I would avoid it um when I went to these camps. Um Yeah, and uh yeah. So um yeah, I would I would avoid that. And there were some weird things that happened um at these camps. Um one time a a dude uh, snuck over into the girls' bunk area, and they got in big trouble for that. Um, and one time, something really weird happened, okay? Now, this is a uh, content warning right now. Warning, content warning. Uh, it's going to be about a, 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 sh a short story, about 10, sec 10 minutes, maybe less. So... Content warning, rape. Um, that's your fair warning. Um, it'll be over, and I'll tell you when it's over. If you need to tune out, uh, just tune out for about five minutes and then check back in, okay? It's not... Okay, it's pretty bad, but, it, but yeah. So, anyway, without any further ado, um, uh, well, uh, oh, Lady Kelgana just got here. What are we talking about? This is my, uh, the topic is there, but this is a content warning section. So there's, there, there's going to be a, a, a brief discussion of rape. Um, this was very weird. Um, one time, uh, we had a guest speaker who came, uh, from another Calvary chapel to speak and, um, specifically to the guys. Um, and, uh, he came and he gave a very boring um, sermon uh, that I don't remember it, but I was into it. And the thing is, sometimes one of the things that would happen is that after a sermon, they would do like a counseling session afterwards where if you were if you were feeling it, you could either go and hang out with your friends or you could have counseling. Now, this was a visiting pastor. So I, being super religious, was like, oh, wow, I want an opportunity to hear what this visiting pastor has to say to see if I can learn some truth from him. So me and a couple other people stayed afterwards instead of going down and playing. And he told us a story. And it was very disturbing. And uh, I don't know what to think of it to this day, um, but I'm going to relay what happened. Um, now, thankfully, I was never harmed or touched in that way. Um, that's very good. But um, um, 
but we sat down for this what we thought was going to be a uh a um a sermon or an adva advantage uh yeah i can do that hold on i'll do that that's a good idea okay okay we'll put this up on the screen real quick there we go here i'll make it bigger even i don't want anybody to be bothered but it is serious and i gotta get back into it okay so there we go um so uh we sat down assuming we were going to talk about religion and this guy started getting really heavy really fast and he was getting into the story and he was getting into his feelings and he was just like um he was just kind of like oh like uh you know i used to be a really bad person uh back before i found god and um and let me just tell you a story okay and he's like never do drugs never drink just stay away from that shit as far as you can and i was like what's going on here and and it and it was a palpable uncomfortable feeling and he proceeded to tell us a story about getting drunk with his friends on on a high school football team um and uh kidnapping and raping a girl who while he was fucking this girl the uh bag they had over her head um slipped off and he found out it was his own sister um now i have no way of knowing whether this guy um was telling the truth whether he was lying out his ass but this is the story he decided to tell me and a bunch of other young guys. Um, and I remember sitting there and going and feeling like we couldn't leave. It was very weird. It did sound, I, I will say, like, it sounds almost too much to make out. But this guy said it with, he delivered this with, with genuinity. And I don't know why, but the memory of sitting there and in this in this beautiful chapel uh, where i expected we would talk about some religious stuff um and being hit with a story of that heaviness with no warning whatsoever like you see i've got a, a content warning up i give you all warnings nothing this guy just came out of nowhere with this and we were like 15. it was very very uncomfortable and weird Um, so yeah, thankfully, again, I didn't know, like, sexual abuse happened to me at these camps. Thank goodness. I don't know if it happened to anybody else. Uh, I know there may have been some issues at some point. I don't know. But that, um, really stuck with me. And that was the sort of thing that, like, um, that was the sort of thing that, like, there was a lot of stuff like that at Calvary Chapel. Weird things that fell out of place that were the result of, like, a lack of, like, just, just religious insulation and, and inability to, um, to, like, understand social boundaries and inability to respect people's well-being. Um, yeah, um... Vermin says, oh my god, that kind of happened in my high school. It was in an ethics class, and a well-known teacher came in and told us a long and gruesome story about being tortured, raped, impregnated, and then harassed. And there was no warning. We just had to sit through it. Yeah, it's really uncomfortable. It's incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable. And we none of us knew how to respond to it, so we just kind of let it go. And keep in mind, um, I was like 14 or 15 probably. Maybe, maybe, yeah, I think I was 14 or 15, maybe 13, somewhere in that ballpark. I don't remember the exact year. Um, and it was very weird. None of the other pastors were around. He had just been left to trust, you know, the, 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 they, the other pastors had just sort of left him to do his thing and talk to us. Very weird. Um, very, very weird. Um, and, uh, yeah. So that was one of the things I wanted to bring up. Um, and then I also wanted to bring up 
uh, another experience I had, which was the last summer camp that I ever went to. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm done talking about that part. So trigger warning portion over. And this is not really super trigger warning stuff, okay? So the last, um, the last uh, summer camp I ever went to um, was a week long um, summer camp for teens. It was for high schoolers. This was when I was in high school. Well, it was just before I went to high school. I was trying to decide which school I wanted to go to, and it was torturing me because I had a choice to either go back to, to the Calvary Chapel School for high school and do that, or I had been given the opportunity to go to a, and, and it's a long story, basically, I had been given a stroke of luck opportunity to go to a very advanced college prep private school for free. It was because of a weird rule in the state the state had to do a bunch of stuff, but it meant that I had this opportunity to go to this great school, and I really wanted to go to that school. But I also felt the need to go to consider going to the Calvary Chapel School. Um, so this was bothering me the entire time I was at the camp, and this and my at this point in time, my dysphoria had gotten worse. I still didn't know that it was dysphoria. Um, but I didn't shower the entire week that I was there because it was a communal shower in the back of a, tr like a trailer that had been built. And I was like, no, I can't, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't bring myself to do it. So I just didn't shower. I was too scared. And there were no private showers anywhere. Not at all. There was only public showers. Now I did take a bath in the ocean at one point. I took a bar of soap with me and jumped in the ocean and washed myself in the ocean and then jumped out and dried off. Um, but yeah. And I had a very bad time at this uh, particular camp. Um, now it was beautiful. Don't get me wrong. It was beautiful, but it was strictly sex segregated. There was the women's tents on one side of a field, a giant path in between with little markers. And then the men and then the men's, uh, camp on the other side I was ruthlessly bullied for this trip um I did not fit in at all um I there were no I couldn't hang out with the girls um so I was stuck with the guys and I got ruthlessly buried but bullied and it was horrible um and I, I however I did have one counseling sh session with none other than the pastor I showed you earlier and interestingly this is a little weird he he actually didn't tell me to go to the Calvary Chapel School. I laid out my case, and he said, you need to follow God because you're very faithful, and I know that, and I've seen that in you, and you God might be calling you to go and be a witness at this non-Christian school. And so I was like, huh, maybe you're right. And so I decided to go to the non-Christian school. Thanks for that one thing. Now, I did, I was a God warrior. I was a God warrior. But, um, but he did say that. And I, and, and interestingly, I think he was smart to do that because it made me respect him for years. Because the other pastors would not do that. The other pastors would just tell people to go to the Calvary Chapel school. But he was above that. You see, he wasn't so petty as to tell you to go to the school. Um, he would tell you to follow God's will. So he did. So I did. So I did. Now, high school is, oh, me too. That school changed my life. And I wouldn't be where I am now if I didn't, hadn't ended up going to that high school. That high school was a lifesaver. But... We get into a new chapter now. Okay, everybody? We're entering into a new chapter. High school. High school was terrible. Okay? It was really hard. Uh, I did not have a good time in high school. I was suicidal for most of high school. Um, I was very depressed, and I didn't know it. My family was anti-psychology. My dad did not believe in psychology, um, so I kept it all to myself. I had a, my relationship with God. I was a God warrior. 
I was the Christian kid at school and everybody knew it because I wore, I always carried my Bible with me and I had my cross necklace and all of that nonsense. And um, I would argue politics with people because I had to. And interestingly, some things were changing um, around this time politically. And uh, one of the things that was changing is that there was a push for gay marriage. And my church did not like that. In fact, my church was heavily responsible for shooting down the first instance of a passage of a passage of gay marriage in my home state. Now it did end up passing a few years later, but my church like hardcore fought it and they had a lot of believers. It's probably because of them. They probably pulled thousands of voters to vote down gay marriage. And they succeeded. It didn't It didn't pass. Um, but during this time, the rhetoric of the church became increasingly homophobic, became increasingly transphobic, became increasingly femme, like misogynist, and increasingly anti-evolution. We had traveling people who would uh, would come in and, and give us things. And here's one of the, let me tell you real quick. Um, this was a mantra. I've said this before, but it became a mantra of my church, this idea, which was an open mind is like a castle with its front gate wide open. You just let everything in and you're gonna find yourself overthrown. That was a mantra that was repeated constantly during this period hard hard indoctrination that is what we call a thought terminating cliche and that was banged into us you open mind is bad because it's like a castle with your with the front door open back to the story so obviously you know kids start going through um through puberty and um all of my classmates were you know and this was the first generation of Calvary Chapel kids. You know what I mean? I was the first generation of people who came of age as the church was growing. And now there was this weird phenomenon of people getting married, specifically girls, getting married the moment that they graduated from high school and getting and having a family immediately because you know, that's how it goes. When you are not allowed to have sex, you just desperately get married so that you can fuck and almost every girl that i knew in high school did that almost every single girl who i knew from the church ended up doing that like i don't even i can't even think of a single girl that i knew um who did exactly that um and it was weird for me because again i didn't attend calvary chapel school i knew a lot of people but I went to a non-Christian school, so I realized how different it was. Oh, yeah, none of those relationships lasted. None of them. I don't know a single person who's still married to the person they married right after high school. Um, it's, it's disastrous. It's horrible. Um, it's not good for people, but we're not going to talk on that. I just wanted to bring that up as a big part of what happened. In this period, in the period when I was in high school, the anti-gay rhetoric was just ratcheted up to 100. And as a result, I, being a member of the church, being a full-on believer, became homophobic myself. And even transphobic. Even though, I mean, I didn't know about trans people. We didn't know. Like, but, um, um, uh, what the hell was I going to say? Um, Getting married, yes. So they all got married, and, and the homophobia ratcheted up. Now, my church didn't know what trans people were. They just thought they were gay people. So I was homophobic. I didn't even know what trans people were. I had been totally insulated from that. My family took me out of sex ed. I had a special sex ed course that was a Christian sex ed course. Bunch of stuff like that. Um, I was a, I was mentally tortured by sex. I'm just going to be completely frank with that. Um like um like i was uh uh I, I was i was just just totally fucked mentally um i felt guilt about any sexual thought it was torture 
It was torture. Okay. Um, I remember I told this story. This is kind of a funny story. I remember I once looked at a furry like porn image and I had a like 12 hour sleepless night of, of, of mental anguish of pure guilt. So that's the type of shit that I was dealing with at the time. Um, it was not healthy. It was not good. I was very unhappy. Um, it led me to be this very, I didn't have healthy relationships in high school because I believed that like you had to find your one true love destined by God. It was very, very unhealthy. Um, just super bad. And, and as a result, it took me forever to actually learn how to have healthy relationships. By the way, I do have very healthy relationships now, but it took a long time. Yeah, I am. Well, yeah, of course I'm dating multiple. Yes. Um, and, uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it was not good, not healthy. It was very painful. Um, and I became homophobic as a result. I was taught to be. And this is, becomes important. Because in my, se uh, in my senior year of high school, I got at the last minute through a big miracle, I got into an incredibly incredibly prestigious writing program i also at this time this is a small little brag just about my writing skills i was also uh given a scholarship for part of my college bill by tabitha king the activist writer and wife of stephen king i'm a good writer as it turns out um but i got into a a incredibly prestigious summer writing program so I went to the summer writing program and boy, oh boy, was it an experience for me. Um, I learned a lot. I met a lot of friends. I stayed a week away from home in a non-Christian environment where I was studying with actually accomplished writers who were teaching me things. And nobody there was super Christian. In fact, they were super progressive. Most of them came from rich liberal families who could send them to schools to learn. And I had culture shock, like hard core culture shock. And, but I made some really good friends. And um, one of the friends I made um, was this super liberal, like it, just imagine like Kylie Brakeman, like Brunchy Brunchy, 100%. Like that was her. She was that type of liberal. And we banged heads constantly. We argued politics all the time. But we ended up staying friends. And we wrote back and forth for a long time after that. And around this time in my life, I was in a weird place. I had spent four years grappling with Christianity in high school and learning all kinds of things. I learned so much through high school at this school. And I had uh, I learned about existentialism. I learned uh, about literature. I learned all kinds of things. And I was beginning to have a different approach to religion than the rest of my family. And in fact, there was so much homework that I couldn't go to, to church as frequently as the rest of my family because I couldn't keep up with my schoolwork. So I was only going to church once a week. And um, then I started having doubts about the church because I learned about evolution. And even though I had critiques of evolution, I the church hated evolution. And I was like, I don't think evolution is necessarily as evil as everyone here says. Maybe there's room to be a Christian who believes in evolution. Now, my church didn't think so. Um, but I did. So I started to have some conflicts and, uh, and then it was time to go to college and I was leaving home for college. I got accepted into a very good school. Um, and, and I didn't have the money to go to this school, by the way, my dad did. And my dad was helping me at first and we'll get to that. 
but I was lucky. My, my grades and my passion was so high that I got into one of the hardest schools to get into in the country. Like, the school I got into, a specialist, a specialist school for film, is harder to get into than Harvard. And I got in with no connections. I had no connections there. My grades were amazing, and I had made films. And I sent them my shitty films. And they were like, wow, this... This fucking bitch loves making movies. Let's get her in here as, as hard as we as quick as we can. Because I made movies. I saved from my summer job and bought a little camera and I filmed a zombie film for my final of one of my classes. And and I sent that to them. And they were like, this is I mean, it was embarrassing, but they lo they loved that I did special effects. I blew shit up. For special effects, we did practical effects. We did all kinds of stuff. It's not USC. Uh, I went to, um, we're here. We're telling the story. I went to RIT's film school, Rochester Institute of Technology. Somewhere I have the zombie film. Um, yeah. So I went to one of the country's best film schools. And I loved that school, by the way. Um, and, uh, and, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was. I, w I mean, I was inspired by the Spy Kids director. I was inspired by a lot of people. But anyway, we'll, we'll continue. Um, oh, sick. You're at RIT for engineering. Great school. I miss it so much. I never finished my degree there because of life, and we'll get there. But yeah. Oh, I visit. No, I've seen the new arts building. The new arts building is amazing. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you. We'll get there. We'll get there. Let's get to the story. Let's get back to the story. So, um, so anyway... Uh, I got into this film school and it was a huge deal and I had been, you know, pen pals with my new friends and I was thinking about things. I was having my viewpoint challenged um, explicitly. Um, I was I was going through a lot of growth and I decided when I went to um, to RIT that I was going to in it d dive into the international community because I wanted to meet as many people as I could. I really wanted to challenge my viewpoints. I wanted to learn to the best of the degree that I did. And I did. And I'm not going to get really super deep into all of the details of that. I met people on the, on like this, the, the first night that I actually spent meeting people in college that wasn't like just moving in when I was by myself and I met people I was I got involved in a giant debate about politics and religion with like three three people who were Hinduists, a Muslim, an atheist, and uh, a Catholic, and me, uh, an evangelical hardcore fundamentalist Christian. And we all argued back and forth, and I learned a bunch. And I was like, "What the fuck?" And I also made a really good friend. I made a friend who was a Catholic agnostic atheist he used to be catholic grew up catholic and we became incredibly good friends and throughout the next years we would basically be like we saw ourselves kind of like tolkien and c.s lewis you know like we we, we would wa we would walk together at night we would argue back and forth about different perspectives on religion and philosophy we would go really hard on it um we would like debate bro shit and then of course we both turned out to be trans that was a whole thing um but we argued back and forth that's a different story for another time um but anyway we argued back and forth all the time and um we talked about religion and it was always very understanding by the way my friend was super patient even though my friend was a atheist and 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 much more philosophically learned than me literally a philosophy major um i you know we i was an interesting person to talk to i was very convicted i had strong i had compared you know relatively strong arguments and and my friend was very very patient with me and um like uh and and so we were taught we would talk about this a lot and Something else happened during this time, which was, well, two, uh, two pretty big things happened during this time. One was, uh, my girlfriend's best friend died 
and it was a horrifying experience. Um, my girlfriend at the time, best friend, died very suddenly, um, and I prayed about it harder than I've ever prayed in my entire life because he went missing first. And uh, when he went missing, I said, I'm going to pray. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do every, like, I, 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 I wanted God to make everything correct. And it didn't happen for all my faith, for all of my fire, for the hours that I would go, I would leave my house and go and walk and pray on a walk on a train track and just pray for hours. Um, and, uh, he turned up, uh, he turned up dead. They found him a couple days later. And, uh, I didn't understand why and how, and, uh, how, like, I couldn't, I didn't even have the faith, with all of my fervor, I didn't have the faith of a mu mustard seed. You know, what is it, the Bible quote that says Jesus told his, his, um, his disciples, if you have faith like that of a mustard seed, you will be able to move mountains, is the quote from the Bible, something along those lines. And um, I didn't. I didn't have the faith. And that hurt. And it was hard. And then another thing happened. Um, a mustard seed is very tiny. Um, yeah, very, very tiny seed. Um and then another thing happened, which is uh, one night, my friend from the writing camp, she called me, the liberal friend, um, who I'd been friends with for a while. And we'd been really good friends, even though we had a lot of differences. Um, and she called me and she was super emotional. And I was sitting there listening. And she was telling me about her friend and uh, and all this stuff that had happened and then she dropped it on me, which is she started a relationship with her best friend. And she was gay, obviously. So I was like, and I was taken aback by this. And I remember where I was when this happened. I remember the feeling that came over me of like, was, I was walking out on a lacrosse pitch. If those of you who went to RIT, you know exactly where I'm talking about. The one right out in front of the right out in front of the gym. And I was stunned. And I was like, and it was weird for me, because it was an unbelievable moment of of uh, cognitive dissonance, because my immediate response was to be happy for her, like holy shit, that's amazing. Like, you just had a relationship work out with your best friend. But then, I was like, but I can't endorse a, a homosexual relationship. Can I? And so I was sitting there listening to her, and I just decided to. I just decided that I could accept her and that I didn't have to obey that urge to, to denounce somebody. And so I just said, that's awesome. And I'm actually super, super happy for you. And she was like, really? I didn't expect that from you. And I'm like, I'm sorry that that's the case. Uh, you know, I've been thinking about religion a lot and I am happy for you. And, uh, Yeah, um, and and so that put a crack in the indoctrination, for real. And I was learning about a lot of other things at the time. Um, but that was one of them. And shortly after that, I had a big argument with my friend, my philosophy friend. Um, a huge argument that uh, was basically, I got pinned, finally. At long last, I got pinned. Um, you know, I got I got super pinned. Um, and that was that my friend managed to logic me logic me into a position where I re realized that either I had to believe that morality is something bigger than God, 
and therefore God cannot be the biggest, most powerful thing in the universe because if morality is bigger than God, then then there's something that God has to obey. Or I had to accept that God determines morality and if God determines morality, then our universe is just might makes, makes right and God is essentially threatening me at hell point um, uh, to denounce my gay friend. That was a very uncomfortable position for me to be in. Right? And I realized, and, and, I, and I was like, okay. And I told my friend, I was sitting there and I was stumped. And I told my friend, I'm like, all right, I got to go to the bathroom. And uh, I went to the bathroom. And I was thinking about it. And I was pissing. And I realized, oh, God. Oh, fuck. I don't believe in God anymore. Oh, fuck. Oh, God. And I literally had a moment while pissing that I realized that the belief was gone. I just couldn't anymore because I had come to this position where I was like, um, I had come to this position where I was like, wait a minute. If God is, if God, if, if, if God being strong is all that makes morality, then fuck that. He's just a space fascist. And yeah, I have it noted in here, pissing away my faith. And, 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 but it wasn't like, it just, it was gone. It just went like that. It was gone in, in an instant. The, the shell went. And I had a moment of panic because I was like, what does this mean? What does this fucking mean? Oh, I forgot something. God damn it. I messed one thing. I missed up one thing. Okay. Which was, uh, I forgot one event that happened that was, that contributed to this, which was, when I went home to my family to my to visit my dad during Christmas and we went to a sermon and I've told this story before we went to a sermon in the mega church in Florida with my dad and they had cameras that I knew because of film school were millions of dollars and they were begging for money from the faithful while running million dollar cameras while having a snow festival a Jesus themed snow festival right next to us. And they were asking for money. And I was like, that was what made me decide that I was done with Calvary Chapel, by the way. That was the decision. And I, I skipped over this because I got a little too eager. And again, I said I'm going to do this a couple times because it's not perfect. But um, when I was there, that was when I decided I was done with Calvary Chapel, but I was still going to be a Christian. And then this moment was the one where I decided I was no longer a Christian. Yeah, I did. I brought that up in our talk, yeah. And then everything went to hell. My life went straight to hell after this. Just just so you all know. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Because um, uh, I kept this on the down low. But, um, and I said I'm not going to go in deep about the trans stuff. But once I realized that I did not have, to eat, because I didn't want to be a homophobe, by the way. Like, I didn't like it. I had a friend who was gay who was shunned by the church, and I didn't like that. I thought that was bad, but I felt like I had to believe it because it was part of Christianity. So being free of this made me, let me think about lots of things, and I realized I was trans. So be, realization of, all, of like, like, accepting that I was trans— and accept and and no and leaving the faith both happened at about the same time. They were very close to one another. Um, it's just how it how it happened. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I made a very foolish decision at the time, which was my mom was coming to visit, and I decided to talk. Very, I love my I loved my mom. Me and my mom have had a complicated um, relationship. Well, I didn't tell my friend immediately. I had to think on it for a couple days, but I knew at that moment. 
Um, my mom came to visit, and I and I had a good relate, really good relationship with my mom. I loved my mom a lot. Our relationship is, you know, has changed a lot over the years. But at that time, this was almost a decade ago. Um, uh, I um, I decided to tell my mom about being trans, and about rethinking religion. And at first, she took it well, but then. Um, but then she didn't. King K two X. So going to church was a cult with you? No, this ate our entire lives. I don't know if you've been listening for the whole story, but it wasn't just going to church. Everything we did was centered around the church. I I talked about this a whole bunch. We, our whole social life was enraptured in the church. My mom married a guy. I didn't even talk about that because it's not my personal story. Um, my my mom married a guy from the church recovery program. And I didn't even, oh, I didn't even talk about that. I even skipped over that. See, this is why I need to do a second one. Um, but that's okay. My church ran a drug recovery program that was free slave labor. Yeah. It was slave labor for the church. Yeah. It's in the notes. Yeah. I'm going to put that in the notes um, for next time. But that's okay. We didn't even get into that. And my stepdad went through that, so I know how it worked intimately, by the way. Um, is my mom still in the church? No, thank God. She left as well. Although she's still a Christian, but she's not involved in that church anymore. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Um, but anyway, let's, uh, let's continue with the story. So, uh, when I came out to my mom... My mom took it well at first, um, and then she panicked when she went back home. She talked to my stepdad, who I did not—I asked her not to tell anybody. She told my stepdad. My stepdad freaked out and called my dad, and my dad lost his shit. My dad lost his shit, and he— Literally, okay, so let me tell you the story, okay? I was, so, uh, I had a very good social life in college. Very, very good. I had very good friends. I was, I had friends from all over the country and, and all over the world, I should say, not the country, all over the world. I was in the international house. And one thing, when you're an international student, you don't usually go home for, um, vacations especially like spring break so um because everybody on our floor you know would would usually just stay at the school um uh we decided hey fuck it let's let's plan a group trip and my friend had a camp in the middle of the woods it was awesome um i'd been there before we planned a whole trip we loaded up a um we loaded up a uh uh, a, a van full of food, marshmallows, everything you could imagine. And we all decided to go camp at my friend's camp in the middle of the woods. That was awesome, by the way. Awesome camp. His, uh, my, my family, my, my friend's family was, was very rich. And they had uh, a camp that had satellite internet in the middle of the woods, had satellite internet, heat, uh, a nice TV, everything. It was super cool. Super cool. Um, so we went to there. They had four wheelers that were there. It was so cool. We shot guns. It was great. Um, no, I mean, it wasn't proper camping, but keep in mind, it had like an old log cabin that had a modern build on uh, attached to it. It was, I mean, anyway, it was amazing. And, um, it was super cool. And we went there with a bunch of my international friends. We played D and D while we were there. I just had I had I had sex with my girlfriend the first time. That was awesome. Um like actual sex because I wasn't a Christian anymore. That was great. Um found out I have a latex allergy. Sucks. Sucks. Um that sucks. That part sucked. Um and uh yeah, and uh and that that sucks. Had a whole bunch of fun with my friends for about three or four days. 
and then I got a phone call. A really bad phone call. And uh, my dad was not happy. I was not out to all of those friends. I was out to some of those friends. Um, most of them not. Um, and my dad said, you're coming home. You got two options. One, you drive over to, you drive the four hours over to, I think it was Pittsburgh was the nearest major airport. Or you fly out of the nearby airfield. And I said, can't I finish my vacation? And my dad said, no. If you want to keep going to college, you come home and talk to me now. So I went to the airstrip and got on a prop plane. That prop plane flew me over to the nearest major airport. And then I flew to go see my dad. Now, Unbeknownst to me, at this time, my dad also had my cousins uh, over, and my dad outed me to most of my family. My dad also wrote me a letter in which he told me I would never pass, that I was a tall, gangly motherfucker who would never pass as a woman, um, and that I was abandoning my faith for liberal Christian bullshit. And um, keep in mind, I had, in preparation for this, I had spent hours putting together a presentation to teach him about trans stuff, to teach him about, um, to like explain it. And then he wanted to talk about atheism a lot um, because he, you know, he'd heard that I stopped believing in Christianity. Um, and so he wanted to talk about that a lot. He was very concerned about that. Um, and, uh, it was really bad. And by the end of the, of the few days I was there after being talked to by all my family members, um, and whatnot, um, my dad gave me the ultimatum and that was, we're done with this shit. I'm not. I'm not letting this liberal shit take over. You're done. He cut off my cell phone. He cut off my school, the card that I used to pay for school expenses. The only way that I could afford to keep going to school because it was impossible. My mom was poor and I didn't have any money. Um, he stopped paying my school bills. So I had one option, which was beg beg the principal the the school to pay for me which they declined i did try and um the other option was to go home with my mom and my mom and my dad and my stepdad coordinated to come get me so they did they came and got me um i had not been able to finish talking to a therapist about being trans yet and i went home the loans were impossible. I was already loaded with loans. It was it's it's an incredibly expensive school. There was it was not possible. It was not possible for me to stay. Um, so I left, and it was horrifically sad. By the way, um, one of the most sad experiences of my entire life. I remember packing up my room. Let me just tell you, I remember packing up my room, listening to music while packing my things, and just crying my eyes out. Um. Because everyone I knew was leaving, it was it was this horribly symbolic gesture and end of an era, and I didn't know what I was going back to, because I had nothing back home. Um, I had nothing, and uh, it was horrible. Yeah, and um, and again, I had just over. I had just sort of left religion. So I didn't really have anything. I didn't have God to fall back on anymore. Um, I was, I was finally, I had finally accepted that I was trans. So I was re, I was 
finally starting to understand parts of my personality, but I didn't have all the answers yet. And oh, I felt totally defeated. Yeah. And immediately when I got back, my parents pressured me to going into a, a Christian therapist, a Christian therapist who told me to wait until I was 30 to transition. Um, and then, and it got worse. So when I went back, I tried to resolve, I tried to like get back into some sort of life that I understood, right? For a while, my parents were a smidge, a tiny bit understanding. They didn't force me to get a job right away because I had just left a successful job. I was doing, by the way, I was working a really nice job um, at, uh, at at school. I had, I had started making my way in the film industry before I was even graduated. I was doing really well. I was very passionate, you know, like, you know how passionate I am. Anyway, um, and uh, that career was, was done. I, so my mom, thankfully, didn't pressure me to jump right back into a, um, into a, a job. Uh, but I didn't have much to do. So I sat around watching videos about atheism. I watched uh, Zinnia Jones, Amazing Atheist, Matt Dillahunty, um, a lot of the atheism stuff. And thinking and writing a lot. Yeah, TJ Kirk. Um, yeah, for a while. And then I got pissed off by TJ Kirk. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, and then a lot of different things. And, uh, and, um, a long story. We'll, we'll get there. Um, and, and, uh, so there was a lot of weird things that happened in this time. Um, I was writing a lot. I have a whole, um, series by the way of of letters back and forth between my various family members i have letters to lotus uh which i still have saved those were very nice um i have letters that i wrote to um my dad those were not nice i had letters i wrote to my mom and of course on my shelf right here i have a letter from my stepdad which was terrible um cursed cursed artifact um Um, and, uh, a lot of strange things happened at this time because of course, uh, everyone in my family had heard that I was a atheist trans person. I was going to say a slur, but, um, they had heard that I was atheist and they didn't like to confront it, but they knew I was argumentative. I'd always been argumentative. And remember in the past, I had been, um, arguing on the side of Jesus and so they were super fascinated. So I tried to keep going to family events and being social and whatnot. Um, and that's where, this is where we get into a nice little story. Old Demon Mama fans will already know this story, but you all can hear it again, where my name came from. So one night I went to my grandma's for a family dinner and we got to talking about religion. And it ended up being my entire family was seated around one end of the table and I was on the other end of the table. And they were all fucking pissed at me because I knew the Bible better than them. I knew the Bible way better than them. I, I, was, an, I was basically a fucking scholar of the Bible. And I was running circles around them. Plus, at that time in my life, all I was doing was consuming all day, every day, because there was nothing for me to do because I'd been kicked out of college. I went from working every single day in the film industry to doing jack shit every single day because I got sent back home. So all I was doing was just sucking up atheism comment content. So when, when my family's picked a fight on religion, I was like, that's it. I'm going to fucking tear your religion to shreds. And, um, and, uh, and... My aunt got so mad that she said, I, I feel like you're like an agent of Satan sent to lead us astray. She got really mad. And I laughed so hard at that, that that's where the demon part of my name came from. It was at that point that I adopted, that I lo started to love demon eth aesthetics because I realized, and, and by the way, that wasn't the first time that that had been implied. My mom had implied something similarly. A lot of people had implied similarly. Um, and it happened again, by the way. Multiple times, members of my family. That was the one that was the loud one that made me laugh. And I, I said, from here on out, 
I'm gonna. St I like the demon aesthetics. I'm gonna go with it. Well, a little bit, a little bit nuts. So that's where the demon part, the mama part, came later. Um, I'll tell the mama part. Why not? We're here. May as well do it. The mama part of my name came from the fact that, well, I was the oldest of my family. I raised, basically raised all of my siblings. So I've always been very nurturing. And I'm never going to have kids of my own. I can't. So I get to be an internet mama. I get to be the mama of the imps. That's where the mama part came from. Because I'm momish. I'm, mo I'm mom people. It's just how I am. So demon mama. There. Name origin. Update for all the new people. Um, yeah, I did. Yes, Ken Monger. Um, although at the end of the day, uh, it, it couldn't, um, oh, 100% vermin. Yeah, 100. The, the Venn, di vermin says the Venn diagram between forcibly religious kids and being really into demons or horny nuns is a circle. Yes, it is. 100% true. Um, and, uh, anyway, so there were many weird encounters with my family like this. Um, that's not very nice to say, Tumitlin. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, but anyway, uh, I, I, there was a lot of strange interactions with, um, with people, uh, from, uh, my family. And one of those uh, was super weird. Uh, my So here's the thing. During this period, while I was trying to work out what I believed, where my position was on religion, I was very critical. In fact, I was writing, I was at the time trying to write a unique sort of critique of the Bible from my perspective for my own purposes. I wrote this whole thing. I still have the document somewhere of writing down these things and trying to come up with arguments. This is when I started to really, really lean into like learning philosophy and debate and whatnot. Um, and I was, I finally did convince my parents to let me go back to school. It was a different school. I was studying a different subject. There wasn't a film program. So I decided, all right, I'll study science. Let's do biology. So I did biology for a little bit. Didn't work out. Ended up dropping out. But it helped me learn a lot of stuff. Um, I learned a fuckload of stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and then some really weird stuff happened. My uncle, uh, got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, and he died a month, almost a month after being, um, diagnosed, uh, which was really aggressive. And that kind of shook my family. And, this is where it gets really fucked. And this is where I'm trying to point out like how fucked religion is. So this is there's a reason why I'm telling this story, okay? My dad used the fact that my uncle was dying to lure me into going out to my uncle's rural house um, where basically an intervention occurred. Um, all of my family members ambushed me um, and started asking me questions about religion, about being trans. They tried to convince me to come back to religion. They tried to convince me to stop being trans. And I couldn't leave because I had ridden there with my dad. And I went there because I wanted to see my uncle before he passed away. Um, and it was really bad. Um, during this period, um, my, my mom by some prodding because of my dad, uh, uh, pushed, pushed me away, uh, and said like this, that, and the other thing. Um, and, uh, th they planned it. They planned it. Um, it was really bad. And I was very uncomfortable. And that was the end of me ever doing anything with my family anymore. I didn't really do much with my family after that. Um, Although, um, something that did happen was I kept going back and forth with my dad. And, uh, even after that, like we had a couple of, um, back and forth, but after that night, and I believe it was that night, in fact, if I remember correctly, I went back home 
and my dad was driving me and it was just me and him in the car and we were talking and my dad said don't change your first name and i said what and he said change your last name if you're still going forward with this don't change your first name change your fucking last name because i don't want anything to do with you And so I got out of the car and left. And um, that was, we had been arguing about religion. Again, religion and trans stuff was inseparable, impossible to separate for Christians, impossible. You couldn't talk about these things differently. So it was the same, as much about atheism as it was about being trans. Um, and I went back inside and we didn't talk for a long time. And um, when we did talk again, which we did eventually, we had a nice conversation. I called him because I felt bad and I missed him. He was my dad. I love my dad. I loved my dad. Um, and I tried two or three times after that to rebuild the connection, but it didn't work. It didn't work. It never happened. The last time I saw my dad was five years ago. Um, and I have no desire to see him. And he was transphobic to me explicitly in public um, the last time I saw him. It was pure chance, by the way. But... Um, How's my mental health been with the separation from my parents? Have you been able to find peace? Um, yeah, now, yes. It took me about 10 years. The last 10 years of my life was me trying to recover. I'm, I'm not kidding about this, by the way. The last 10 years of my life was me trying to recover from being, by, from being disowned by my family and sort of thrown out. Like, you have no idea. Like, I don't think that most people can understand how much that fucks you. Like, it completely ruins you. Um... I struggled for 10 years and now I am like making a show, which is a miracle. Like I don't even, I can't even believe that I'm doing it. Um, but yeah, you had nothing. I literally, and, and here's the thing. It gets worse. Um, because, uh, I forgot to mention one piece, which was that my mom kicked me out. Um, m largely because of, pressure because of my dad my dad was always putting pressure on my mom even though they were divorced that's how he is he's a control freak um my my dad was pressuring my mom and my stepdad and my stepdad and my mom uh decided that they didn't want me in the house now i could read this letter but it's too much so i'm not going to read this letter basically they said you're a liberal atheist and you're swerving into degeneracy you need to get out we don't want you around the kids. The kids, my siblings who I loved and I helped raise, by the way. So um, they threw me out. I mean, literally, they kicked me out and my friend and and my stuff was in the little pile on the edge of the driveway. And my best friend and his dad came to help me move into the spare room of my friend. So that was the only reason I wasn't freezing my ass off in Maine. Um... Yeah. And uh, for a while, uh, yeah, retcon 404. Um, yeah, Christian love. It's weird how that works. But this is the same. But keep in mind, these were the behaviors they'd been taught by the church to close your mind, to block people out. Um, and and it is wild. And, and again, my mom did ultimately leave the church, thankfully. My dad is a hypocrite and he's back involved in the church still he's still involved in the cult or he was some of my uh some of my siblings i talked to some that i some i don't one of my siblings uh went ended up becoming a missionary for the um for the cult by the way um uh my my brother is like a missionary for the cult and then he ended up joining the military as a spec ops or something some random shit uh, uh killer um or something i don't know um yeah they did they tried oh they really tried leftist killbot i think that would have been convenient for them um but i'm not going to talk about my siblings here i want to focus on religion so to focus back on religion um i dealt with a lot and i thought a lot at the time um you know i had a lot of time to think about these things and so 
I spent a lot of time. In fact, for a while, I ran this little blog for like a couple months that was called Trans Substantiation. And it was an atheism blog about substantiating trans arguments from the Bible for people who have to deal with that sort of thing. It was shit. It was a terrible blog. I had no idea how to do a blog, but I tried. Um, and I, uh, I was, um, yeah, I know it's very silly. Um, I don't know. You might, I don't even know. I don't even know if you'd be able to, it's like a, it was like a blog spot thing. Anyway. Um, I was proud of the name, but, uh, and I, I was toying with a lot of different philosophies at the time. I had been very influenced by objectivism and what ended up, what ended up happening, by the way, um, um, what ended up happening, um, was I ended up like sort of pseudo adopting objectivism and then refuting objectivism and converting my friend, the friend who deconvert helped deconvert me from religion, I deconverted from objectivism because I got really into objectivism and then I found a bunch of internal inconsistencies and I tore it up. And I was like, ah, I don't believe it. I think objectivism is bullshit. So I ended up I ended up being I ended up being the the one who saved my friend from the object it was we're the debt is paid let's put it that way okay the debt is paid you don't want to be a, an ain rand person these days so I, I saved my friend our debt settled okay you helped me out of the one cult i helped you out of another cult objectivism is a hyper capitalist uh like like and and cap philosophy philosophy um oh thank you very much trans neuter mage um so yeah um that conflict with my family raged uh none of the most of those relationships have never resolved um and uh then over time i sort of uh started to rethink religion uh, not religion i i started to rethink a lot of different things and uh, i've been an atheist ever since i deconverted um but uh, I had various periods uh, of time where I had different approaches and thoughts. And you've seen me do my little map of beliefs. But I mostly became a, a socially minded liberal. A progressive was where I fell. Um, and oh, what was the custody arrangement after the divorce? So at first it was I would visit my dad on Wednesdays and weekends. Um, when he, but then he moved away. He moved to a different state, and so I only ever saw him. Um, we would go visit him during holidays and, and for half of the summer. So my dad was very rich. Um, none of that. Occasionally, he would let us, like, we would, he would let us bring our game consoles back home so we could play them, but that's it. Like, nothing else. We, we would go and stay with him, and we would basically live in luxury while we were with him. And then we would go home and live back in, in our poor fucking shit home back in Maine. Um, and he did that intentionally. My dad hated my mom. Like, I've never witnessed such hatred. Um, and yeah, but it was very weird. So some things I am, I was privileged enough to have some lucky experiences like being able to go on a cruise and my dad taking me to travel overseas. Um, but, uh, but that wasn't my life. It was a vacation. I got to go on a vacation in a nice place. And I didn't get to bring those things home usually. Um, occasionally, da my dad would let us have little little um, gadgets, more or less. So that he did it. No, he did it to torture my mom. He he did it to torture my mom, not even us. My dad didn't mean to torture us. Um, uh, uh, my dad is a narcissist, Abs like an absolute like categorical narcissist, one hundred percent. Um, but yeah, he did it to torture my mom because imagine he could afford to send us an iPad, an iPod for Christmas or a, or an Xbox. My mom could not buy us those luxuries. My mom, my dad could feed us nice food and take us out to restaurants. My mom could not. So we would go home and we would tell mom about all the fun we had. We'd be like, mom, we had fun. We went to all these restaurants. We should go to a restaurant sometime. And my mom would just be like, sorry, we can't. We can't, you know, and then she wouldn't be able to buy the fancy gifts at Christmas. Um, and, uh, my dad would buy us something fancy. Oh, it was horrible. I know he did it to torture my mom and I know he succeeded at that. 
I know he tortured my mom. Like, I know that's super personal, but, like, I know he did that to do to torture her. And, and it succeeded because she felt powerless. She had no money, you know? She couldn't buy us fancy, nice things, but my dad could, and he would only do it when he wanted to. He was showing off. Oh, and he's gotten worse about that, by the way. There's a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Like, I mean, he did things that, like, um, like he would he rewarded my sibling. When my brother made a fight to go live with him, he bought my brother, like, a car. He brought him everything. We didn't, he didn't buy us a car that we could use at home. My, my mom had to scrape together to get me and my siblings a car to drive to school with that was, like, a used-ass car. Was he paying child support? Yeah, but he was, he was incredibly litigious. My dad would sue over everything, and they went to court a million times. Genuine piece of shit. Genuine piece of shit. Yeah. And my dad would sue all the time. My mom had to go to court with him so many times. It was ridiculous. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's really rough. Anyway. This is supposed to be about the religion. So let's let's do that. Uh, let's do the religion thing. Yeah. So uh, my dad used religion as a tool. My dad was not genuinely religious. Uh, he left religion many times, and then he would use it as a bludgeon to control people. Um, and he still does that to this day, by the way. Um, and uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about religion over the last 10 years. Um, and over time... Um, I've rethought a lot of things, you know? Um, for a long time, I was just strictly anti-religion. I would have described myself as being, like, anti-religion, and I think that religion is bad, like, ex intrinsically. I don't think I believe that anymore. Um, however, I do have a lot of critiques for for um, religion in general. Um, and that's what I want to talk about next, because I want to talk about where I'm at now. My beliefs about religion... Um, why I believe the things I do about religion and how I came to believe them. Um, so one of the things that uh, I believe very strongly now is that the problem is not strictly with religion, but it is dogma and traditionalism. Those two things are, in my opinion, very, very um important to critique because both of those things dogma and traditionalism can um and a focus and i should say a focus on domination um can exist outside of religion like m thoughtless repetition a worship of what was before um and and a desire to control others are just so core to it and the thing is I think that people make a mistake when they focus that all on religion, because although I will agree that relig that many religions fall into these things, so do many ideologies, so do many non-religious political ideologies, so do many worldview beliefs. It's not just religion that falls to this stuff. And I think that there are help healthy and positive expressions of religion that aren't necessarily um, that aren't necessarily like scientifically rigorous or whatever, but well, that's the thing. I'm not talking about traditions. I'm talking about tradition with a capital T tradition. Traditions are actions that you do for various reasons. And there are some very good Christian. There are some very good traditions and there are some very bad ones, but tradition and traditionalism is where you worship that which came before because Presumably, you presume that it is what may brought you to where you are, and therefore it must be perpetuated. Tradition is bad. Traditions, like putting up a Christmas tree, is fine. Those things are totally fine. But tradition. And yes, there is a huge overlap with fascism. It is impossible to ignore in my church. My church was very fascistic. Very fascistic. Um... I agree with, with that statement, the idea that dogma is the death of rationality. Um, see, and that's the thing. People ask about decentralized religions like paganism or neo-paganism. And I 
I don't have a problem with those. I don't even necessarily have a problem with certain forms of Christianity. Um, though I think that you can get into the nitty gritty and argue factuality and all kinds of things, the reality is that we don't know everything. And that always means that there is room for some things to be interpreted differently or to be speaking of a truth. So again, my focus is that is not so much on religion. You know what I mean? In and of itself. Now, there are certain religions and certain structures. Um, it's not just God of the gaps, though. It's We can't get into the whole thing here. Um, what I'm saying is, is that I focus less these days on religion, even though I would have when I was in my when I was super super on atheist atheism. Um, uh, the uh, I, I think that people make a mistake in fixating too much on religion, and something that I notice that happens, and this is a general critique I have for online spaces, specifically English speaking, they always think that every religion is exactly like Christianity. And they're not. They're just, they're not. Like, religions are totally different. Um, and, and, and there's just, like, there's completely different viewpoints and approaches to them and totally different philosophies that are underlying different religions. And I think that there are many, there are many religions that are not nearly as harmful as the highly, highly traditionalistic, highly hierarchical, highly domineering, highly imperial Christianity that we recognize. And also the highly patriarchal, highly domineering, highly hierarchical forms of Islam that we recognize. There are so many religions in the world. I think it's a mistake to target religion as a whole. And instead, we should focus on the elements that make a belief system dangerous. Thought terminating cliches, conspiratorial thinking, um, uh, manipulative guilt-based worldviews, dogma, these sorts of things. Oh, and uh, Gayfesh, an infinite amount of times. How many times did you hear things like Buddha didn't die for our sins? That's how you know Buddhism isn't real. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, and I don't think it's just conservatism is what makes religion bad, although that's certainly a part of it. The fact that religions don't embrace a future usually, they're usually very doomer, is very unhealthy. Um, and also, there is another thing. But here's the thing. One of the most one one of the things that made my church so dangerous, what made it into a cult, was how they utilized social isolation. But you don't have to be religious to use social isolation. It just helps. It helps to be able to have something convincing like a claim to divinity. You know? It's uh that does help, but that doesn't but that's not intrinsic to it. So yeah, I think there's reasons for us to think about alternative approaches to critiquing these structures. Am I divine? I'm infernal. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my position um, on religion these days. Uh, I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about religion anymore, which is nice because uh, I have bigger things, ethical things to think about that you can actually sort out using better systems than just religious ethics. Um, and, uh, and, uh, but I think that there is a lot of room to build healthier relationships with religious people, um, both as lefties and in general, and to target more accurately, not religion, but the, the, the elements that pervade our society. For example, let me give you an example of this. The Trump cult, they touch on religion, but that's not a Jesus cult. They're all Jesus freaks in there, in there, but it's not a Jesus cult. It's a personality cult. It uses fascistic dogma. It uses weird traditionalism. It uses social pressure and isolation, but it's not a religion. It's not a religion. So I think we need to be smarter about targeting those things. And I want to build a better description. But yeah. Yeah. So 
That's where I'm at. Oh, oh, uh, Lady Kelgana, some people believe that Jesus is the second coming, or that Trump is the second coming of Jesus, but I don't think most people do. Yes, and that's true, BBQ Hoss. You, as you say, on the opposite side, MLK was heavily inspired by his faith. Yes, Christian socialism is a big movement. What is a religion? Well, that's the problem. That's why being anti-religion doesn't really make sense to me. It's too broad. It's too silly and broad. And, and it doesn't help. It doesn't help us have conversations. There are a lot of religious people who are open to leftism, who aren't the type of religious person that you think of when you think of a fundamentalist. Fundamentalism is a specific form of indoctrination. And most people aren't indoctrinated in that way. Most religious people aren't indoctrinated like that. I'm just saying. So I think we need to rethink how we approach that personally. And that, everyone, is the spiritual deconstruction. You now know the story of my life growing up in a cult, leaving the cult, and coming to new conclusions about religion. And I will do this again in the future at some point in a more refined format, but I'm proud of this. And I hope it was super, super interesting for you.